Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the virtual distinguished speaker series. It is uh, with great pleasure that I welcome our guest this evening, Kara Sabin, the CEO of Sundial Brands. So Kara, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Bill. It's such a pleasure to be here. So, uh, so Kara, we, we have lots to talk about, but let me, let me bring you back to uh, the, the beginning, so to speak, uh, not, not when you were born, but, uh, but one of the things that, that makes you extra special is, of course, that you're a Fuqua alum, uh, graduated uh, a, a few years ago, <laughs> Just and, and have been, uh, one of the things we're really grateful for is that, that you've been deeply connected with the school over time. But uh, let me start with why, why did you choose to come to Fuqua for your MBA? Uh, first of all, Bill, I have to say this is such a full circle moment to even be part of this Distinguished Speaker Series because when I was a first year student, I remember sitting in Janine Auditorium and Ann Fudge, who was then a president at Kraft Foods, came to speak. And to see uh, another Ex to see an executive that looked like me, that was from where I'm from, which is the Washington DC area, um, it just, it, it opened my whole world. And so um, to even be here speaking with you is just really an out of body experience in some ways. Um, but what brought me to Fuqua, I had quite a few friends that I'd gone to college with. I graduated from the University of Virginia undergrad and I think it still is the case. There is this pipeline there seems to be from UVA to, to Fuqua. And um, I had a couple of friends um, that were um, at Fuqua at the time, and they were telling me about the experience in Team Fuqua. And everyone talks about how their school is a team-oriented environment. But after I attended the workshop uh, for minority applicants and was able to actually experience the school, the professors, the students, the alumni, um, there was no other place I wanted to be. So um, it, it really was that familial vibe that I experienced. And 22 years later, um, we still really are a family, as you know, Derek and Owen, and uh, just it's, it's a, it's a fam familial environment. Um, and that's what really drew me to Fuqua. So uh, a bit later on, uh, I'm going to talk about what you kind of this light bulb that went on about what might have been missing from your Fuqua experience. But, uh, but what, what's been stickiest about your, your Fuqua experience as you've navigated your career? I think you have articulated it in the time that you've been here is this notion of IQ, EQ, and DQ. It wasn't really in that framework at the time but it is that element of, of, of decency and um, ethics and um, the collaboration. And so as I've, as I've gone throughout my career, I've realized when I'm asked that question, what is your leadership style? It's a collaborative leadership style. And that doesn't mean that I um, give up decision-making authority or power, uh, but it really means my style is to take in different perspectives, um, absorb those, and then proceed with, with a decision. And so I, I really do think that that was shaped from my experience at Fuqua. So I'm back to this DSS event where you're full circle. The, the event itself must have been very powerful because you ended up going to Kraft Foods. I did. Uh, and and so what's interesting is your I think your first job out of Fuqua was at Kraft and then you went to Capital One and then uh, and then L'Oreal and then it's been all, all beauty all the time pretty much since then. Um, so what what happened uh, in terms of this this start into foods and then financial services and then you seem to have found the, the sector that you truly love. Yeah, and I, you know, I have to say, when I was a first year student, because I had majored in Spanish and I didn't really have a strong business background, as I was going through the interview process my first year for internships, I got rejection, rejection, rejection. And my last interview was actually with Kraft, which is where I most wanted, wanted to go. 
And so it was like one of those make or break moments where I knew I had to nail it in this interview. Um, so I was able to get the internship. And then when I came back for second year, um, I continued to interview because I, I wanted to explore all of the different options. And I was lucky to have three additional um, interviews, but I did, as you said, go back to craft and I wanted to have more of a traditional CPG brand management experience. Um, when I went to Capital One, I had moved back down to the DC area, which is where I'm from, um, really for, for family reasons and personal reasons. And then when I was able to come back to New York, I wanted to focus on something that was of interest to me. So I um, love music. So I was talking to friends that were in the music industry. And then I also um, was talking to friends in the beauty industry because that seemed very specialized and dynamic. And um, I landed at L'Oreal Paris, um, which is part of L'Oreal. And that really opened my eyes to what a career in beauty could be. And, um, you know, I, I, from the outside, I thought beauty was frivolous and superficial and tactical and not really, you know, meaningful. But as I got into the industry, I realized that there's science and analytics and strategy and um, it's brand building, it's consumer psychology. And so all of that was so um, fascinating to me and the fast paced nature of beauty um, was really what kept me going. Um, and as I was going throughout my career, I, you know, had a really good, um, a really good track record. I was, you know, being promoted and having really interesting assignments. I was traveling all over the world. Um, and so that really sustained me um, in the early part of my beauty career. So one, one question that uh, will confront our graduates as, as they work through their careers is, when do I make the change? And, and so um, you, you've made some pivots in, in your career um, and you've made some, some changes within, within the beauty sector as well. Uh, very senior role, uh, VP of global marketing with Clinique, very senior role, VP of, of marketing for the Americas, for, for NARS. So how, walk us through, how do you make a decision about when to when to walk into a new opportunity when, when you have been so successful where you are? It's a, it's a very good question because on the surface, um, you would think each of those moves were very strategic and planned moves. Um, but the reality is, particularly as I started to reach that vice president level, I felt it really difficult to continue to climb. So I would do really well, make a big impact, feel I was making strong contributions, receive really strong performance evaluations and reviews, and just kind of get passed over. And so I, you know, it's, it's, it's been written, it's documented that women of color, black women specifically, aside from the wage gap that we experience, in terms of ascending up the corporate ladder, we are often impacted by implicit bias or, or other things. And so some women at that point in their career choose to leave corporate America altogether and start their own business, which is why you see a lot of, um, of new businesses and entrepreneurial ventures are founded by, by women of color, by black women. For me, the way that I was able to navigate that was to be able to go into a new assignment at a new, new company and kind of try all over again. And so, you know, just being completely honest with you, that is, is really what the driver was for some of those moves later um, in my career. So this, th this brings me to the, the observation that you shared with me uh, recently, which was, as you've confronted those issues in your career, you're not sure that, that Fuqua prepared you for what, what you would face. That, that I guess you put it as you were naive. You just felt like, I, I just have to work twice as hard and, and I'll have all the opportunities. And, uh, and yet that's not how it worked. So with, with reflection, how, how can we help the people that will follow you be more aware of these issues and, and what, 
what have you found as a way to deal with these issues? Because here you are, you're, you, you are a black woman CEO. And so you, you've gotten to that destination. I think most black boys and girls as they're being raised by their parents are told you have to work twice as hard to get just as far as your counterparts. And it shouldn't, that shouldn't have to be a lesson that we're taught, but the reality is it is. And so I was raised to believe if I worked twice, twice as hard and, you know, put in good work that it would be rewarded and, and, and that's where, you know, where, where it would be. Um, but to your point, I realized as I was going through those moves that I didn't feel adequately prepared. And I don't know if that was from the Fuqua experience or if it was from the notion that if there is, if you are an exception, you're a black only, or the, the idea of except, exceptionalism, that that will take you throughout your career. And that quite frankly, smacked me in the face at a certain point in my career where I realized that is not enough. It's not enough to be the only, it's not enough to be exceptional. There are other factors outside of my control that may contribute to how I'm perceived, how I'm ad how people advocate for me or don't advocate for me. So what I would say is, you know, when I was in, at Fuqua 22 years ago, most people were aspiring to be in corporate America. And I imagine the case today is obviously people still want to continue to go into finance and consulting and marketing tech, but there probably is more of an appetite for entrepreneurial ventures. And so I think many um, women, uh, black women that were in my position at the time are probably seeking to be their own business owner. And, and I actually think that's a good thing. Um, at the same time though, I do think the way to um, really equip any business leader, whether they be a black woman or a person of color or a, you know a, a, a white student, is to really help them understand the value of diversity. And so with the unfortunate events that have happened in the past couple of weeks with the death of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, it has in a mind boggling way brought to light the idea of systemic racism and oppression and the discussions around it are unlike anything that I've ever experienced. And so I think what I'm, what I'm encouraged by is that there is a realization that this is not a black person's issue to solve. This is an issue that our institutions have to engage in. Our institutions like Duke University, our institutions like the corporations that many of us go to work for. Um, so when people ask me what is, you know, what is the answer, I don't have the answer. I have some ideas, but we, we need everyone committed and engaged in, in helping solve the, the issue. Yeah. What, are there any things that you would point to as advice in terms of uh, you faced all of these barriers, either explicit or implicit on your path to CEO, but, but anything in particular that you would say helped you get past those barriers? Um, perseverance, <laughs> perseverance and um, just never, never giving up. Um, I think the, uh, the appointment that, I, that I'm in now is the CEO of, of Sundial Brands and, and Shane Moisture is our, our biggest brand. It's, it's this interesting position to be in, not only because of, of, of the title and the business that I manage, but that I uh, was brought into this role and hired by another Black woman who I have admired from afar for many, many years. Um, A.C. Eggleston Bracey, and working in the context of a huge corporation, Unilever. So of, of all the places where, where I've worked, I, I can say that Unilever is by far the most progressive, uh, the most committed to really building purposeful brands that are doing good for the community, doing good for the environment. And it isn't just lip service, it really is the way that the brand operates. And so to be in a position uh, where I am 
being, you know, I'm in the context of this huge corporation, but I'm working very closely with this, this uh, leader who is another black woman, it erases a lot of the implicit bias for obvious reasons. So um, there's a shorthand where I don't have to explain why my hair looks like this. It actually is celebrated. Um, I don't have to undo her perception of my ability or my intelligence. Um, so for me, I'd say it, it really is being in a position where I'm working on a business, working with a leader and working in the context of a company where differences are truly, truly celebrated and sought out. So part of, part of what got you where you are is someone actually did advocate for you because I know you've, you've uh, written about the, the issue of a lack of, of active advocacy when, uh, when you're going up for a promotion. And so, but it, you're not going to get that advocacy if you don't have uh, those senior levels populated by, uh, by people of color, uh, women, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, uh, and, I, and, I, and I use that term active ad advocacy really intentionally because people talk about mentors and sponsors and advocates. And in my career, I had all of those. I had mentors, I had sponsors, I had people that would advocate for me. But this notion of actively advocating, when you're having that year, once a year conversation of, of succession planning and pipeline, if, if whoever's at the table is not actively advocating for you, then it, it, it doesn't matter. And so, um, and I don't think that those people have to necessarily be women or be people of color. I think it's more difficult if you are a person of color and the people at, around the table don't represent you. Um, but, but it is that notion of active advocacy that I think is what, what people need. And if you are in the minority, it is more difficult to get that. Okay. So uh, in, in that regard, you, you took action to try to create more of a support network. And so this past, this past Juneteenth was actually a special anniversary for you. Um, can you tell us what, can you tell us about the, the one year anniversary yeah. this, this past Juneteenth? It's, it's remarkable that Juneteenth is now something that everyone knows. <laughs> I mean, to have corporations giving days off for Juneteenth, that it just, it blows my mind that, that that's where we are, but, but I'm here for it and I celebrate it. Um, but when I was at Estee Lauder, I met a woman named Ella Gorla, who we immediately hit it off. She was a co-chair of the Black ERG Employee Resource Group at Estee Lauder, and we had participated in a couple of events. We kept in touch. I left Estee Lauder to go uh, somewhere else. And we were having drinks and just kind of talking about our experience being in beauty, being Black women in beauty. And uh, it was just one of those weeks where we both were feeling not supported, um, like we had done some amazing things and we weren't getting the recognition that we felt we deserved. And instead of you know the analogy of being asked uh, to have a seat at someone else's table, we decided to build our own table. And in, in the beginning, we really thought it was going to be a dinner for 25 women. And we had reached out, it, you know, it wasn't even difficult. It was friends that we knew within the industry, friends of friends, women that were um, either founders of companies or executives at different companies. And our hope was just to have an intimate dinner of tw with 25 women, have it be me meaningful to them. And a year in, in that first dinner was on Juneteenth and, and that was very intentional. And a year later, which was last Friday, now we've grown, we've grown from 25 women to a social network of over 25,000 women. And um, it just, it speaks to the need for representation, for um, affinity groups. And we're in this moment where we started this organization. We knew personally that there was a need for this because we felt we needed it but to see everything that's happening within the industry um, kind of align now with where we have been is, has been very rewarding. 
So I, I have to say that a thousand X growth over a one year period is, is pretty impressive, uh, but also speaks to, as you said, that, that this is something that, that is really needed. And, um, and so I've had, I've had conversations with, uh, with some of our current black students where, where they've told me that, that some of their, uh, their white classmates don't understand why you need these affinity groups. So can, can you kind of help, help us understand why these affinity groups are so important um, in terms of being able to effectively manage your careers and, and feel, uh, you know, feel a part of something? I think when, so speaking for the women that are a part of our organization that are in corporate America, when you are the only in a room, in an organization, in a group of 200 leaders, it's lonely and you feel isolated. And it, in that isolation, you have feelings of imposter syndrome where you feel like, should I really be here? Um, and you don't feel in that isolation, you don't feel support. And so there is something around, um, having the, the network and having support that is very enriching and fulfilling. And the germ of the idea, even before Ellen and I talked about it, every quarter, uh, me and uh, three other uh, girlfriends that are in beauty, black women, would have a quarterly dinner. And we, you know, it would always be difficult to pick a date that everyone was available. But inevitably, after that dinner, we would leave with our head higher, our soul feel filled, we would be ready, you know, to take on our organization. And so the need is uh, to just feel supported and to feel like you're not the only one and that you're not in isolation. And if you think about, if you think about uh, executives um, at, you know, the, the highest level, so you think about Fortune 500 companies, right now there's only four black CEOs, uh, all men. Even if we were to get to levels that represent what, what we are in the population, <laughs> we're woefully behind there. And, and for women specifically, um, you know, there, there's no black women at, at the Fortune 500 level. And, and so in that lack of representation, um, it, it, it's difficult to see your path. So when I was appointed to this role, one of the few people that I could reach out to was Anne Sempowski Ward who is also a, a double dookie Fuqua grad, and she is CEO of, of Curio Brands. And I, I literally had no one else that I could call that would understand what I was about to walk into. And so the purpose and the value of those affinity groups is so you don't feel isolated, so you can share information, so you can be uh, well-informed and, and be more impactful. So, Life, life changes when you become a CEO. What, uh, what did you find to be most different about your life when you stepped into the CEO role? Two things, um, and this is pre-COVID, but COVID hit shortly after uh, I started in December of last year. The, the first realization was that it, it truly is a 24-7, 365 days a year kind of job. And, and I've been in demanding roles before in global assignments where you start you know, at six in the morning and you end at 10 at night. But, but the notion that you are always, always on um, is, is something that I was like, oh, okay, this really means you're always on, uh, no time off. And I'm, I'm able to carve out time for, for myself and for my family, but, but that uh, was you know, a big uh, awakening. And the other element that, that has been more challenging for me, quite honestly, is, is the public uh, facing aspect. So when you are leading an organization, you are also the public face of that organization and you're doing press and you're doing interviews and you may be called to do something on TV and those, you know, I've, I've done speaking engagements in the past, but being such a public face 
um, is something that is new for me, not quite as comfortable as is uh, it may be perceived that it is. I, I genu genuinely am a private person, so to, to be so uh, vulnerable and open to the public is, is something that I'm, I'm getting adjusted to. Well, th thank you for being willing to do that with us tonight. Well, I um, always have time for, for a few more. <laughs> so, uh, so if I take you back uh, to, to the, the brief moment in time uh, that you were CEO pre-COVID, uh, what what was it that most attracted you to Sundial and in terms of what opportunities you saw and what did you see as the biggest challenges that, that you felt like you would have to tackle as CEO? What drew me was the company's mission and purpose because it so tightly aligns with my own personal passion. Um, and so that just in terms of fit, there could have not been any stronger fit. Um, everything that I was doing with 25 Black Women in Beauty, everything that I had been doing up until this point uh, in my career really led me to this and, and it felt like a natural fit. The biggest challenge um, was taking over for a founder. So we were founded by Richelieu Dennis uh, and the Dennis family. They you know, started this business 30 years ago. All of the incredible work that they have done, their legacy that they've cultivated to then take over for such a dynamic leader who literally blood, sweat, and tears went into building this business is daunting. Um, to be the first non-founder, non-family member to lead a business and uh, a testament to, to, to Rich and, and the kind of human being he is. Um, I have a very collaborative relationship with him. Um, we, we have standing weekly meetings where we touch base. Uh, and even though he's not involved in the day-to-day -day business, uh, we still work on, on many levels with his other ventures that he's involved in. But that was very intimidating to, to walk into that position and take over for the person that had founded the business with his family. So I, I can imagine that's, that's very challenging, even, even if he's not taking an active role uh, with the company, that everyone you're working with is thinking, well, what, what would the founder have done here? And, right. and so I imagine that, that that can be challenging when part of what you're trying to do is to actually drive change and, and make new things happen that maybe would not have happened. Uh, so, so what have you found to be the best way to, to navigate this transition, which is a, it's a classic challenge to have a, a CEO uh, step in for a founder. And, and oftentimes that's a very uh, difficult moment in, in the history of a company. Yeah, I, so when I stepped in, it had been two years post acquisition with Unilever. Um, so a lot of the typical um, integration challenges that happen anytime a, a larger company is, is um, acquiring another company we had kind of gone through that period. Um, so I was able to really step in and be much more forward thinking. Um, but uh, yeah, to your point, many of the people on my team uh, have, have been there um, pre-acquisition. Pre, uh, but what I was able to do is, is just come in and, and have a clear point of view based on being a consumer of the brand, that, that was really beneficial. So it wasn't like it was a business I had to learn. It was you know, a business and, and products that I was intimately familiar with and, and understood because I am the consumer. So that was something that was very easy. Um, and combining that with, with um, my own perspective based on my experience, um, you know, that was kind of my, my mindset coming in. The very first thing, the two first things that I did when I walked in the door, <clears throat> one, I wanted to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with everybody in my organization. Mm -hmm. And working with my assistant, I was like, I know it's a lot of people, but I, I, I would really like to spend 15 minutes, a half an hour. I just felt it was really important for me to individually know everyone in the organization, no matter what their level was. 
And then the second thing I wanted to do was um, really uh, set some groundwork around our culture and what I wanted our culture to be and learn what the state of the culture was at the time. And so those were the very, very first two things that I focused on. Um, and, um, you know, what, it, what else did I do other than that? Just kind of follow my, my, my compass of, of my vision of where I, I would like for us to go and taking in feedback from, from people that, that I value that have been with the business for a while. So coming back to the, this founder issue, uh, it was not that long ago that uh, you, you woke up to discover that uh, Shea Moisture was trending on social media and not in the way that you would want, in, in a very negative way. So can you, can you walk us through what that was about and, and your response? Yeah. <laughs> So that was uh, a week or two ago, and they say that you should not check social media the first thing when you wake up in the morning, but something told me, other than texting my mom, who I think my mom's probably watching, so my mom and I text first thing in the morning, and then I'll check social media, and I looked at, um, looked at Twitter and saw that Shea Moisture was tr trending, and so of course I went down the rabbit hole to see what was going on. And, um, and I understood why it was trending. Um, with everything that has happened over the past couple of weeks, and again, um, organizations, institutions, people being awakened to racism and that this isn't just based solely on events that have happened over the past couple of weeks, but the awakening that there are systemic generational issues here at play. Um, that is, that's the undercurrent of what was going on. And so there has been this, this call to action for consumers to support black owned businesses and to buy from uh, black founders, which I 100% support and is something that, that I personally think is important. Um, we've been talking about it and advocating for it with 25 Black Women in Beauty and within Shea Moisture, that is an integral part of our business model is, is supporting Black-owned businesses. So the, the reason I felt I, I wanted to lend my voice to the conversation is in social media, it doesn't really leave room to have nuanced thorough discourse. It's really, you know, what can you say succinctly in the most clever, witty way? And I wanted to have an opportunity in my voice to speak to the work that uh, the founders of our business had done and have a conversation of not just Black-owned versus not Black-owned, but Black-owned, Black-led, Black-majority-led at the executive level. Um, serving a black consumer and doing good for the black community what is the impact that you're actually making and so that's a more nuanced conversation other than gotcha you're not black owned um and so i wanted to 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 um, you know voice my perspective on that and um i think it's an important conversation and i and i also don't think it's an either or i think it's an and and so what i talked about in my my letter was through the um, acquisition of Sundial, um, there was a $100 million investment fund that was created called the New Voices Fund. And from that fund, we have invested in 100% Black-owned businesses. We have not promoted that or advertised that, but through that sell, sell to Unilever, we actually were able to create funds to fuel them back into Black-owned businesses. And then there are other streams of work that, that we have always do, done and will continue to do. And so that's what I wanted to talk about is um, it's, it's not just are you black owned or not black owned, it's really what is the impact that you're making on the community. And, and setting up this fund was a, a part of the transaction that's with right. the founder, right? That's right. Yeah. Really brilliantly by, by, by uh, Dennis, yeah. So did did you stop the, the the negative social media this is this is something that every ceo has to deal with that the things you know you don't know always get to control the narrative so yeah. did your effort work to turn the tide do you think 
Uh, no, I don't think it did. I think I I I think it will take multiple conversations. Um, I don't think it's it's going to stop. I, I think the the call to action is still going to be there as it should. Um, one of the really exciting things that has come up over the past couple of weeks re related to this is, um, and you've probably heard of it, the pull up for change or the, the uh, pull up or shut up challenge that was founded by uh, Sharon, who's um, founder of Uma Beauty. And it was a 72 hour period where she challenged companies um, to divulge their um, numbers of executives and number of black executives specifically. And so it was something that we participated in. And so all of this was happening at the same time where consumers were realizing that many of the brands that they consume, whether they were positioned for the black consumer or not, are woefully underrepresented um, in terms of, of diversity. And so I think one of the great things to come out of this is this radical transparency. I, I mean, I would have never imagined that um, we would be in this position. And so now that you know, everyone is exposed at the same time. Everyone has been transparent. And so now the real work to do is what is the action? How are you going to um, diversify, diversify your supplier network? What are you doing in terms of um, increasing your pipeline internally, um, you know, your agencies that you work with? Um, that's, that's the positive change that needs to come. So uh, oftentimes someone goes to business school and they say, I'm I'm at the beginning of a journey where I want to become CEO, and they have this image in their head that that being CEO is is a glamorous thing. <laughs> uh, you laugh. So uh, so tell tell us what what is the the hardest thing um, that that you've had to deal with as CEO, and and then to give you something more positive to say, what, what's been the thing that's, that's brought you the most joy uh, since you've been CEO? The hardest part um, is feeling the weight of responsibility of managing people. And uh, it's, I've felt it more acutely, you know, my, my 10 years as CEO has coincided with COVID and, and with all of the national unrest. So it's hard to, you know, divorce those from each other. Um, but as we were going through COVID, knowing that I had responsibility for our frontline employees who were still manufacturing our hygiene products um, and feeling personally accountable for their lives, um, knowing that as a, as a company, we were creating the safest place where anyone could possibly be. Um, but just knowing, being in the New York, New Jersey area, which which was a hot spot, every every night going to bed worrying about about uh, my frontline employees, and then for the people that are were working from home and, and are still working from home, initially, people are in very different places. So there are people that live alone, that have really suffered with that isolation. There are people that are trying to navigate, uh, you know, being with their family and their kids and daycare and schooling and all of that. And so trying to be a leader, be connected to my team and really just worrying about my, my team's physical and emotional and mental well-being. That, that has been um, a disproportionate uh, part of my mental energy that I would not have anticipated before. Um, most rewarding is being able to really be an advocate for, for my team and for the business. And so the, the, the nice side of having a platform and participating in, in interviews and conferences and that sort of thing is it allows me to spotlight the work that my team is doing. Um, and so that is really, really rewarding because they work so hard and there's so much uh, great work that the team does. And so to be able to be the steward of the brand, but also represent my team is, is really rewarding. So the, uh, if, I, if I take you back to kind of the, the front end of your time as CEO, when, when COVID uh, initially was viewed as a health crisis and then morphed into so much more, um, 
people people were just very very scared um it, it got scarier but they were very scared about this this notion of a pandemic and um and so what have you found you can do to reduce reduce the anxiety and um in a in an environment where many people can't be in touch with each other physically uh, to to really help people feel like they still belong to this organization that where you're you're trying to create something special with them. Yeah, that that has been a challenge because as I said, when I walked in the door, building culture was really important, and so that was something I I thought I would be able to do in a physical sense, and not do it in a virtual sense, um, but. One of the things that I think has been effective for us is, um, especially in the early days of COVID, um, I found having more frequent contact with my team was good for everyone. So um, in the past, we would have maybe had a weekly touch base meeting. Um, We, in the first week or two, were touching. We would have a stand-up meeting um, every day and then uh, quickly transition into three times a week. But having that regular contact, I think, for most people was reassuring and it it was a sense of normalcy. Um, I also personally had have a cameras on policy for myself. So I feel like as a leader, as we're on these Zoom calls or these teams or whatever, you know, video conference um, we're, we're using, I feel it's important that I need to be present, I need to be engaged. And if my camera's off or if I'm muted, then I'm not really connecting. Um, I know my team uh, sometimes wishes that, you know, <laughs> they didn't have to turn their cameras on and I've given them that, that option. You know, it's not a requirement, um, but I, I do know for me, that also helps with my anxiety to feel connected. So if I'm, you know, on a call with 15 people, if I'm just looking at my face and a bunch of dots from other people, it feels a little, a little odd. Um, but I also think the nature of, of meeting in this virtual way is even more intimate in, in some ways than meeting in person because you're peering into people's homes, you're hearing whatever is going on in their household. Um, you may see a dog or a kid or whatever, you know, depending on, on, on who you're speaking with. And it has made work in some ways a bit more informal where we've had to have grace with each other. You may hear a lawnmower or you may, may hear a baby crying um, and, and that's okay. And, and so I think making everyone feel at ease that this isn't perfect, we're all figuring this out, um, has just created a, a, a more informal uh, atmosphere. So uh, you, Earlier in our conversation, you talked about um, the, the challenges of being a black woman and moving up the, the corporate ranks and, and achieving the position as CEO. And clearly, clearly there are many, many systemic issues that, that get in the way, given the numbers that we see. Uh, but can you talk about, you're there now. What are the challenges of being a CEO when you're a black woman? What What are the things that 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 you've discovered that you you go, wow, that that doesn't that doesn't feel good or right, or or maybe there are things you're finding that that do feel good and right, but are, are there unique challenges that that you feel you need to be aware of in your role? <sighs> To be honest, the the challenges that that I've experienced in this role have been more external than they have internal. Um, Internally, um, I don't really feel like I have, you know, I I feel very well supported. I feel like I have the respect and the ear of, of senior management. I'm engaged in really important strategic conversations, but also given the autonomy to manage my business the way that I see fit. And I don't, um, you know, I have to go through tons of approvals for, for, for virtually anything, uh, but it's more of the, the external um, nature. And the, the challenge right now is actually all of the requests 
Um, and again, Fuqua excluded, because I always, uh, there's not a speaking engagement that I'm asked to do that I don't participate in, but all of the other um, institutions or organizations or clubs that want to hear the Black person give their perspective, and that is, um, it's overwhelming. Um, and so I've, I've had to be really, really intentional about where I spend my time and is that request coming from an, an authentic place or is it coming because it's the expedient thing to do to say that you, you know, have this, this black speaker. So because I am one of the few, um, you know, black women at, at this level for the, at the, for the managing this type of company, um, just the, the request to speak and participate and give your opinion and write a piece here, that, that is what has been the biggest challenge lately. So uh, it, it is true. I have asked uh, other CEOs what it's like to lead as a white male. Uh, so, but that's a very unusual request to hear, well, what's it like to be a, a white male CEO since there's so many of you? I would love to hear what that answer is, by yeah. the way. Uh, so, uh, interesting. I mean, the, the one that was most interesting was a, a realization of privilege mm -hmm. and that, that this individual talked about how he didn't, it, he, he discovered that privilege was invisible to him mm -hmm. and that you know, before, before these events that have been so traumatic where many people have come to that realization. Uh, but, but you get asked that question all the time. I've asked you that question. It's like a tax on your time. Mm -hmm. uh, an, an extra an extra weight that you have to carry, and so how do you how do you feel about that tax and and your you know, your response to the reality of of that tax in your life? I so I engage. Um, first of all, I don't think it's my problem or Black women's problem to solve because the issues that we're facing are institutional and have been around for generations. So I alone and black women and black people cannot solve it. We need everyone to solve it. And I think if anything, uh, if there's any silver lining around these tragic, tragic events, it's that people to your point have come to the realization that this is a human rights issue. And um, some of the conversations I've had uh, I was um, doing an interview and at the end they asked me, you know, is there anything that you can share with the readers or with, with our organization? And I was talking about uh, dismantling white privilege and, um, you know, how they need to have conversations about what it means to be an anti-racist. And those are not conversations I ever would have had before. And so it's liberating to be able to have those kinds of conversations. Um, but, but what I'm doing is I'm spending my time with the institutions that are important to me, like Duke and Fuqua, that I want to help, I want to help from the inside. Um, and within my own company and, and broader Unilever. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving my time uh, because these are organizations and institutions that are important to me, um, but it, it definitely is not um, an issue that can be solved alone by people of color or by black people. We need everyone to be engaged in, in, um, in this. So as we've, uh, we've entered into uh, the, the third phase of this COVID crisis, which is now, as you put it, a human rights crisis. Um, that hasn't been simple for you in terms of leading your organization. What, what's been most complicated about uh, this human rights crisis that is unfolding around us as it enters into your workplace? Yeah. It's, um, you know, I thought COVID was tough. This has been tougher. Um, tougher for me personally and, and tough for me as a leader. And, you know, I, I realize about myself, one of the things that I do for, for better or for worse in moments of stress is I compartmentalize. And so I, in my mind, think I can control when and how I process things that I'm not ready to process. And um, 
probably the Thursday of the week that, that uh, George Floyd was murdered, it just hit me like a ton of bricks that I, that I, I can't compartmentalize that. It is, it, it just brought up so many feelings and emotions and um, experiences that I had growing up that my family had had, um, you know, just, so having, um, not feel like you have the space to process, you have to be on, you have to be present, you have to lead and not being able to give yourself room to uh, emotionally take care of yourself. And someone was saying that um, for black America, that those uh, three last deaths, and unfortunately there's, there's been more since then, have felt like a death in the family. And when you have a death in the family, people are granted um, leave to mourn and to process, and you're able to, to take bereavement. And we've not been able to do that. And we've been 24 seven because we're working in this, you know, COVID work from home environment. And so it, it almost felt suffocating personally to not be able to have the time to process and handle that. And then at the same time, managing a team that also has been personally impacted. I have um, an individual on my team that was uh, the victim of police brutality years ago um, in a very real devastating way. I have um, a person on my team that uh, comes from a law enforcement family um, and that person felt uh, uncomfortable in having conversations because of the perception of law enforcement right now. And so realizing that in, in addition to, you know, processing and managing my own personal feelings, the feelings of, of my family, um, leading a team that also were going through their things. I, I have someone on my team that really felt it was important to, to protest and, and peacefully protested and was sprayed with tear gas. And so to have all of that going on in the backdrop of just doing your day job, um, has been unlike any experience I've ever, ever had. So these are, uh, these are unprecedented times with, without a doubt. Uh, are, you, are you feeling uh, pessimistic as, as we see the human tragedy around us? Or do you feel like maybe, maybe this time we'll actually make some progress? Right now I'm feeling um, optimistic. I'm feeling optimistic because um, in my 50 years on earth, I don't feel like I've ever um, experienced a time when non-black people want to have conversations around race and go beyond conversations and move to actions. Um, and then speaking with people in my parents' generation and, and older people that have been through the civil rights movement and from them to hear that this feels different to them as well, that makes me feel encouraged. It definitely makes me feel encouraged. What, what do we need to watch out for so that we don't lose positive momentum? I think that's, I think the point is we have to seize the moment. This, this is the moment right now. Um, and, and so I think that is the danger, is if we think, oh, we'll, we'll handle it in 2021, the moment is right now. The moment to have these conversations is now. There's an appetite to have these conversations now. This, this is the time. And I, you know, Bill, I know you and I have had conversations about the speed of change and, and uh, in my organization, we've had similar conversations and it's, you know, we're not going to topple systemic racism in a matter of weeks. Um, at the same time, there are people like me and, and people that look like me who have been black our whole lives. And so this doesn't feel like a couple of weeks. This feels like a lifetime and, and long, long, long overdue. Um, so the moment is now, the moment is, is right now to, to, to make change. So um, advice, advice to the school as we seize that moment, and, and then I'll, I'll give you an opportunity for more personal advice to our audience. Uh, I, I think a lot of the things that um, you addressed, Bill, in your, your latest communication, I think 
um, we're, we're looking at the right areas in terms of the impact on, on the broader Durham community, which I said to you, you know, that was one of the original Black Wall Streets. And so um, as a business school, I would like to see us doing more with uh, business owners in the Durham area. Um, I, I think there are a lot of initiatives with students, with prospective students, with alumni, with faculty. I think, you know, you're, I, I know, Bill, that, that you're, you're, you, you have the right direction, and now we have to really put meat, meat to it. What are the details, um, and, and how will we measure success, and when will we measure success? I think that's, you know, refining and, and more detail around the plan is what we need to do. So my, my commitment to you is that I don't want to have uh, some future dean uh, interview some future version of Kara Saban and, and, and have her say, Fuqua really didn't prepare me for, for what I face in my career. And, and so we, this is the moment. We, we have to seize this moment and we have to, we have to make a difference in the lives of individuals, but we also have to make a difference in terms of the systems that are really built uh, to have this persistent structural bias um, within. So with that, let me ask you the, the final question, which is uh, what, what would you tell, what would you tell uh, the, the current version of yourself? What would you tell the person graduating uh, back in 1998 from Fuqua, you know, having benefited from all the wisdom you've accumulated. And of course, um, you don't get to do that, but you do get to share that with all the people who will be graduating. And so um, your, your thoughts. That's such a touching question. Um, I think I would say, uh, believe in yourself. I think it, it, it takes a while or it took me a while as you're coming of age and um, finding out what your strengths are, um, but just really believing in yourself. And the other thing that I think is really important is know that no matter where you are as you're coming up, that there are always people that are watching and that may be looking to you. And so the way that you move, the, the example that you set, um, there are people that, that have reached out to me that have said, you know, how I have, have touched them with, with words or with a conversation. Um, and so I, I feel it's really important, no matter if you're a student at Fuqua, you've just graduated, you're thinking about um, attending, uh, I think it's really important to also know that you can make an impact no matter where you are in your career and that you can do that by leading by example or by um, directly uh, making an impact. But I, I think that's really, really critical. And it's something that I didn't quite realize um, 22 years ago, but, but uh, definitely realize now. So Kara, thank you. Thank you so much. We're, we're so proud to call you one of our own. Thank um, and thank you for showing us what it means to be a, a true leader of consequence. And so many, many thanks for modeling those behaviors in a way that, that others can see how to, how to lead in a way that, that really will change lives for the better. And of course, we're so grateful that you remain committed to our community and work with us to ensure that we get better. So many, many thanks, Kara. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Have a good evening. All right. Yeah. Thanks, All right. everybody, for joining us. Thank you.